feel like we say this every time we start making YouTube videos again, but our past year has been absolutely crazy. We filmed so many beautiful weddings, went to Hawaii, made a video about that trip, went to Portugal, video to come soon, and worked on different commercial projects spanning all different scales of production. And you know what? We used the Canon Cinema line to film all these projects. One question we always get is how we achieve such great looking images out of the Canon C series. And while color grading plays a big role in the look of our films, it's ultimately what happens in camera that affects the image the most. So today we're tackling the best in-camera tools and settings for incredible looking footage. There's going to be a focus on the C100s and 200s since that's what we use the most, but these tips apply to pretty much any camera out there. The first step to getting the best look out of the C100 and C200 happens before we even turn on our cameras. It's understanding its limitations, its strengths, and weaknesses. Ignoring that the C200 can shoot raw to a CFast card, both the C200 and C100 are only capable of shooting 8-bit 420 compressed video. On paper, those specs would make any filmmaker cringe. But as always, with Canon, the internal image processing and color science gives us a killer final image as long as we use the camera to its full potential. Think of it this way. With almost every video camera, you're shooting moving JPEGs. Not even full quality JPEGs, just these two megapixel blurry compressed images. All of the settings that you shoot in camera are now burnt into your footage, and there's only so much you can do in post to better the quality of that image. So the first thing is knowing when to shoot, what to shoot, and how to shoot it. Recognizing when a shot won't turn out because of the limitations of your camera and doing everything possible to cater to its strengths. In the case of the C-Series cameras, that means avoiding high contrast, harsh lit conditions that won't allow us to take full advantage of the sensor's dynamic range, or wide shots with too much fine detail that will just get muddied in post. There are times when you can't avoid doing so, and other times where it works stylistically, but for the most part, keep this in mind while shooting so you can find better vantage points or new locations for your subject altogether. But what about those times when the shooting situation is ideal? We still have to get our camera settings as close to perfect as we can. We can ruin a perfectly good shot by not exposing correctly, which leads us to our next step. Use the exposure tools to achieve the best exposure. Surprisingly, this is one of the biggest mistakes new filmmakers make, and it's a simple one to avoid. Our rule of thumb is always exposed for your highlights. The brightest point of your frame should always fall within perfect exposure. There are of course exceptions to the rule, or times where your subject would be so underexposed if we expose for our highlights that we have to overexpose some aspect of our frame. But for the most part, you always want to keep your highlights in check. Why? Because once you've overexposed your highlights, that's detail that you'll never get back in your footage. It's gone, forever. So we're way better to underexpose our footage and get that detail back from the shadows than the alternative. This is true for any camera, from entry level to professional industry cameras. The C100s and 200s have a few excellent tools to achieve that perfect exposure, because at the end of the day, we don't want to under or overexpose anything. We want it to be just right. So first up is the waveform monitor, the best tool and one we use the most. Think of it as a supercharged histogram for video. It basically converts your frame from left to right into a graphical reading of your exposure. Anything below zero is underexposed and anything above 100 is overexposed. And in an ideal setting, everything just sort of falls in the middle. Another thing to keep in mind is that skin tone should fall anywhere between 50 and 70 IRE, dependent on your subject. So it's another factor that'll help you ultimately choose the most correct exposure. The next tool is your light meter. It's less reliable, but occasionally there's things that'll throw your waveform off, like a candlelit reception where all the candles will have to be overexposed. At these times, the light meter is super helpful. Technically, the most balanced exposure is achieved when you fall right in the middle of the meter. But keep in mind that this is a reading taking your entire frame into account, so things like bright skies and snow can easily throw it off. Lastly, we can use our zebras to identify the overexposed areas in our shot. This is a tool we seldom use because we use our waveform monitor more than anything and can usually tell just by looking at the LCD what the problem areas are within our frame. But 
if you do use them, we change our sensitivity settings to the following so that they only show up when we're dangerously close to overexposing. So we're happy with our exposure and are ready to hit record. But there's one last important setting, the most important setting when crafting the look of our film and post, white balance. This is so important to get right because as we've mentioned before, all these camera settings are cooked into your footage. Shoot something too warm and there's only so much you can do in post to cool or balance that footage out. Think of it this way. When you shoot a raw photo and you bring it into Lightroom and you change its white balance, you're basically moving the color temperature of that photo across the spectrum from blue to yellow. But when you bring an MP4 file into Premiere and you change its white balance, you're basically adding yellow or blue to the footage on top of the white balance it's already been shot on. So what do we do? In control situations, we'll usually use a white or gray card to see what the camera reads as the proper white balance. But the proper white balance is not always what we want. So after we have that reading, we'll adjust the white balance to where we want it to be stylistically. For us, that's usually on the warmer end of the spectrum. But when we're in run and gun situations and don't have time to white balance card it, we have a quick cheat that helps us achieve the same results. We'll switch to auto white balance and let the camera get a reading of what it thinks the proper white balance is. We'll know what that Kelvin reading is in our heads and switch back to manual to adjust our white balance to the desired look. Because your eyes can get easily used to the white balance in a room, it's helpful knowing what the camera thinks the most neutral color temperature is. That way we know whether our settings are close or totally off. One last note about white balance. It's a lot more than just warm or cold. It's about your green and magenta shift as well. And once you look at your image from along those four planes, it'll make your shooting and grading decisions a lot easier. The C200 lets you change your tint on the fly, along with your white balance. But in the C100, it's actually buried in the custom picture menu. So unless you shoot on the C200 and can easily change your tint, we actually recommend to just be aware of your surroundings. If your environment has a horrible green cast, then change your settings. If not, small adjustments in pose will usually help get rid of any cast your image should have. And with Canon, that's usually a strong magenta cast. Lastly, we want to tackle custom picture profiles. Everyone always asks us whether we shoot on C-Log, and we actually don't. 95% of the time, we shoot on YDR. It's a clean profile that still uses the wide dynamic range of the camera without the flatness associated with C-Log. The only thing we modified on the profile is turning the sharpness all the way down. YDR gives us enough wiggle room to grade and pose, while also giving us great looking files should a client want raw footage afterwards. So that's our list of tips on how to get the best looking footage out of Canon cinema cameras, or any camera for that matter. We're excited to get back into creating YouTube videos and are working in the background to create an educational workshop model. Details to come later in the year. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and give us a follow on Instagram to stay up to date with our comings and goings. And if there's anything you'd like us to tackle in a future video, send us a DM on Instagram or comment below and let us know. Till next time.